Welcome, everyone. Thank you for coming to our second Community Conversations um, with Sierra Club main chapter. We are live on Facebook and we are recording this and we will post it on our website afterwards. Um, so this really started as, um, as a way to help us all get through coronavirus and it was started by our volunteer leaders, which is the heart of Sierra Club as a grassroots organization. And um, I'll let introduce one of our executive committee members who will um, introduce our speaker, David Gibson. Um, and right before that, just a quick overview of some logistics as we have quite a few people on this call um, and via Facebook for the first time. So this will be just kind of an experiment with the Facebook side, but David will um, give the presentation and then there'll be time for discussion. That's what we hope in these talks. The best way to do that with a larger group has been the chat bar. So you see the chat icon on the bottom of your screen and you click on that. Um, you'll be able to see everyone's questions and you'll be able to type a question if you have one. Um, that really is the best way. There are other ways you can raise your hand, um, but it's a little challenging to see everyone at once. So. I encourage you to use the chat bar and we'll do our best to get through as many questions as possible by eight o'clock. And um, then if there is a little extra time, David might be able to take some questions from people and um, for, you know, five or 10 minutes after that. Um, and we will do our best to get through all your questions because this is a really interesting topic and I will um, introduce John Brodigam. Thank you very much, Matt. Um, and welcome everybody to another in our series, um, Community Kitchen Table Conversations. In this time of social distancing, it's never been more important to continue to connect and to find ways to collaborate uh, together uh, to do the things that we're passionate about, all of us. And tonight is no exception to that. This is another series, uh, another in our series of informative, um, timely uh, discussions where we'll have a a presentation from somebody I think you're going to find is truly an expert and then there'll be an opportunity uh, for questions afterwards. Um, David Gibson is a, a member of the Sierra Club Executive Committee and, and the energy team, all volunteer um, groups as, as you know, and um, we uh, welcome your interest and encourage your engagement with us if you are interested in volunteer opportunities. Um, we have things going on all the time at the state and local level um, in a variety of areas. And um, we are, um, uh, there's a lot of fun and a lot of rewarding um, opportunities to engage with the chapter. So we encourage you to um, connect with us if you um, have an interest and you haven't done so already. I see many people on, on the call already have. Um, David's going to speak about um, financing, um, financing some of our solutions um, to the climate crisis. Um, uh, I think David is uh, very persuasive that the biggest barrier to the implementation of clean energy projects and other climate solutions is the upfront cost that people struggle with. Um, people of all income struggle with it, but particularly people um, of, of modest in family incomes um, find um, some of these solutions out of reach. David brings a great deal of experience to this uh, work. Over a decade of experience um, implementing climate solutions, uh, part of that time out west for five years, he led the development of Envirolutions Project Recharge, which is a training program for middle and high school students to learn how to make their homes and schools more efficient. From 2014 to 2016, he implemented efficiency programs statewide in Nevada for the Governor's Office of Energy, where he helped create the HEROES program for low-income seniors. And he also developed over $50 million in self-funding performance contracting projects for public buildings. Uh, David's a resident of Morrill. He designed solar and heat pump systems for revision energy, um, where he's helping residents across the state to transition away from fossil fuels. So really delighted to have uh, David Gibson with us here today. And with that, I'll turn it over to David. All right, great. Thanks, John. Um, I'm going to share my screen here. Can everyone see my screen now? Yes. Yes. Okay, perfect. Uh, 
Yeah. So, um, so this is, this is my house in Morrill. Um, and it was built in 1828. So it's a post and beam farmhouse and we've transitioned it entirely off of fossil fuels. Um, so we heat with heat pumps. We have a heat pump water heater, a very efficient uh, hot water heater. And um, we have not turned on our oil boiler in more than two years now. Um, and so we have a wood stove for backup, but the heat pumps provide all of our heat. And the solar array does not quite offset all of our electricity. We're not quite to net zero energy, um, but we are um, entirely off of fossil fuels in terms of consumption on, on the site. And um, to me, that's something that can happen in every home. And to address the climate crisis needs to happen in every single home across the state. Um, and so um, we'll, we'll talk about that and how we can make that happen tonight. Um, I want to start with a land acknowledgement. Um, as, as you all know, um, we are on stolen land. Um, and in these times in particular, the indigenous people are being hit especially hard by the pandemic. And in most cases have fewer resources and less support. Um, I'd encourage any of you who are able to make a donation either to your local Native American tribe or to an organization. Uh, I know there's different uh, organizations in the Navajo Nation um, where they've had some of the worst COVID-19 um, cases um, as well as there's local organizations like the Wabanaki Health and Wellness. Um, and just in, in these times, for those of us who are able, um, I, I think it's really important to, to help support those who have been here and cared for the land for generations and generations before us. Um, so I, I studied civil and environmental engineering at Worcester Polytechnic Institute. Um, and worked in construction management for three years uh, before moving to Reno, Nevada. Um, I quit my job in construction management to become an AmeriCorps volunteer with a, a nonprofit in Reno called Envirolution, um, which was started by a couple of friends of mine. Um, and, and we developed curriculum um, and led in school education um, and teaching middle school and high school students about efficiency and clean energy and had homework assignments for them to take steps in their own homes, as well as using the school as a learning laboratory and uh, assessing how the schools could become more efficient. Um, and before I left the nonprofit, they, they, uh, we wrote a successful National Science Foundation grant. And so they were awarded $1.2 million to continue and expand the program after I left. So they're now working with over 100 teachers in 35 different schools um, in Northern Nevada and Northern California. Um, and I've led some trainings with different teachers at, at different points, but I would love to bring that curriculum to Maine. Um, it's, it's the same thing. Um, every home needs the same steps and, and buildings all use energy in the same types of ways. Um, so if any of you are teachers or engaged in education, I'd, I'd be happy to share resources on that front. Um, and as John mentioned, I work for Revision Energy and design solar and heat pump systems um, here in Maine. And I've transitioned two houses entirely off of fossil fuels, our, our current home in Morrill, as well as our uh, previous home out in Reno. And in Reno, I made a video showing how we transitioned to 100% clean energy um, at the website there, poweredbysunshine.org. Um, so there's a nice 12 minute documentary if you wanna check that out. Um, and so in the decade plus that I spent in the uh, clean energy industry, uh, the biggest barrier that I found is the upfront cost. Uh, most families don't have $10,000 in savings to do a, a, an efficiency retrofit of their home or have 20 or $30,000 to invest in solar on their home. Uh, and so if you don't have the upfront cost, um, you're looking at either taking out a home equity loan, um, but if you don't have the equity in your house, then that's not an option. Um, and then there's so many people that have poor credit and, and are shut out of the lending markets because their credit scores are too low. Um, and so it's really important to uh, create 
financing programs that are available to everyone throughout the state and aren't limited um, just to those with, with other means as well. Um, and I wanted to mention here uh, the impacts on low income households um, are, are particularly um, harsh um, because if, if the average family is spending $3,500 a year, um, low income households are least likely or least able to afford the cost of energy retrofits for their home. So they're more likely to have higher energy usage and higher energy costs. And on top of that, um, if, they, if, if the average is $3,500 uh, for residential household energy each year in Maine, um, $3,500 is a much bigger percentage of your income if you're making 10 or 20 grand a year uh, versus someone who's making 80 or 100 grand a year, that 3,500 is a much smaller portion of their income. So they're more likely to be living in less efficient houses, have the least ability to pay for these improvements, um, and their energy costs are a much higher portion of their, of their income. So it's really important to focus on how we can make the clean energy transition work for low income households and, and people in poverty. Um, there are a lot of existing funding programs uh, in Maine uh, already. Um, Efficiency Maine has great residential rebates as well as loans up to 15 grand for efficiency projects. The Finance Authority of Maine does a lot of commercial programs providing direct loans and credit enhancements and they underwrite loans, um, but only in the commercial market. Um, they have a restriction that they can't work with, with residential projects. Uh, CEI, Coastal Enterprises, um, does a lot of work with multifamily residential and they, they provide business loans as well, um, as well as power purchase agreements for municipalities. Um, and so those three organizations do a great job and have a lot of, have a lot of different lending programs and rebates available um, that, are, that are beneficial for, for clean energy. Um, the Federal Housing Authority offers energy efficient mortgages, which allow you to finance the upfront cost of efficiency improvements into your, into your mortgage when you buy or refinance a house. Um, they also offer a solar loan that allows you to finance the upfront cost of solar into your mortgage as well. Um, and I, I led some training programs out in Reno with the Reno Sparks Association of Realtors and local lenders, training the, the lenders and the realtors about these FHA programs, because uh, essentially no one knows that energy efficient mortgages exist. And there's no better time to finance efficiency and clean energy than into the purchase price of your home where you are um, getting the best interest rate that you'll probably ever, you know, ever see, um, as well as paying it off over a 30 year time period rather than a, a shorter loan through, through the private market. Um, and I've, I've had some conversations with realtors in Portland and we were not able to identify a single mortgage lender in the state of Maine that offers the FHA energy efficient mortgages or solar loans. And there are FHA programs available nationally. And, and to me, that's, that's a huge opportunity here in the state to, um, increase funding options. Uh, most of the local banks, Bangor Savings Bank, Norway Savings Bank, all of our, all of our local banks and credit unions, um, the ones that offer home mortgages, you have the option to refinance your, your home and, or take out a home equity line of credit. And so those are other ways to, to finance um, efficiency or clean energy projects. Um, and then the, the final option is a personal loan, which is typically unsecured and um, and often has a higher interest rate of 10 or 12%, which, which often makes it cost prohibitive. Um, if you can finance at two, three, four, five percent 5%, um, usually the energy improvements will pay for themselves and, and reduce your monthly costs. Uh, but if you've got to finance at a much higher interest rate, then usually your monthly payment ends up being more, um, which for many people is still very doable. Um, there's also other, other financing options. Um, there's third party solar loans. Um, for instance, at Revision, we work with an organization called Mosaic um, and they were established specifically for financing solar. Um, and they're, they're a B Corp, like we are a, a benefits corporation. 
focused on the, the triple bottom line rather than just profits. Um, and so they're a great company to work with, but they have a lot of the same issues that, that other lenders do that we see. Um, high credit requirements that exclude uh, a lot of households um, and, and other lending requirements um, are often, often prohibitive. So um, there's, and then, and then for towns and school districts, um, there's the option of energy saving performance contracting, uh, which is one of the programs that I led in Nevada um, and funds the upfront cost of efficiency or clean energy improvements for public buildings, which are then repaid um, through guaranteed energy savings over the life of the project. Um, and so that's a third party source of funding that um, is available for, for those types of municipal projects. Um, and so then in terms of, of funding gaps in the state, um, I've already mentioned um, that we don't have, Bangor Savings Bank does do a lot of financing for commercial projects, um, but at this point they don't have a residential um, solar loan or, or residential offerings for clean energy. And I'm not aware of another local bank in the state that has solar or, or energy efficiency loans available. Um, typically, and this, is, this was certainly my experience in Nevada as well, uh, most banks look at financing efficiency in solar the same way that they look at financing a car or a boat or an RV. And, and you have to have a certain amount of equity in your home or you have to have a certain credit score, or you have to have a certain uh, income level to meet their loan to income ratio. Uh, but unlike a boat or an RV, uh, which lose most of their value the day you drive them off the lot, uh, a solar or efficiency project will pay for itself over time through the energy savings. So it's a very different uh, funding need that banks have not caught up with. Um, and so um, in Maine, we need to have options for people with low credit or no credit. Um, and one option that a, that a green bank typically offers is a loan loss reserve, which is a pool of five or $10 million, um, depending on the size of the program, that is set up to pay for any defaults. If the, if the banks have any clean energy projects that default, um, the loan loss reserve guarantees that they won't suffer more than a certain rate of default. So they're on the hook for the first percent or you know, whatever, whatever the numbers work out to. And then the loan loss reserve picks up the rest. And that reduces risks for the banks and the credit unions, which encourages them to participate in the clean energy market, as well as um, reduces their interest rate because a lot of, a lot of the, the reason for interest is to help offset for losses when people default on loans. Um, and so if there's less risk, then you can have a lower interest rate. Um, on the commercial side, uh, there, there needs, we need more funding options for small businesses. Um, usually larger businesses have the ability to finance independently. Um, and we need a, a commercial property assessed clean energy program in Maine. Um, and there was a bill that would have created uh, commercial PACE this year, um, but with the, the session ending prematurely um, due to the virus, um, that, that bill was not passed out of the legislature. Um, and, then, and then outside of efficiency and clean energy, we're gonna need financing for electric vehicles and for the charging infrastructure. Uh, resiliency projects in terms of uh, climate change and climate solutions helping to fund regenerative farming and forestry. Um, and potentially broadband as well. We know that broadband is a, is a tremendous need in the state. Um, and so these are all funding gaps that a green bank could help to fill. Um, and I helped, I worked with Representative Ziegler a year and a half or so ago, um, who, who represents Moral and Liberty, both where I live and where I work. Um, and I, I worked with him to draft LD 1634, um, which, which would create a statewide clean energy fund. Um, and I use the term clean energy fund and green bank interchangeably, just so that you're all aware. Um, green bank tends to be the more common term, but the word bank is actually highly regulated. And so the Maine Bankers Association and other groups 
Um, we don't want us to use the word green bank just because we are not a bank as it's defined in the law. Um, but I'll, I'll use those terms interchangeably. Um, and so a green bank just broadly is a, is a public or nonprofit institution that inve invests public funding to encourage investment in clean energy. Um, and there's a big difference between um, providing investments and offering rebates or grants. Uh, most of Efficiency Maine's funding um, provides rebates for projects. Uh, but if you've got a, a $1,000 rebate for a $5,000 heat pump system, you still have to be able to afford the other $4,000 of that. Um, and, but if you're offered a low interest loan, then you have the ability to, to finance the, the entire project. And, and the great thing about uh, making investments and in, in financing projects rather than giving out grants is that the money recycles and you can use it over and over again. As the first person pays back their loan, you then have more money to invest in, in other projects. Um, and so green banks often have programs like commercial property assessed clean energy. They often create loan loss reserves to encourage other local um, banks and, and financial institutions to participate. They offer credit enhancements um, and depending on the market, whether it's low income residential or commercial properties that can take some different forms, but essentially helping boost someone's credit score to the point that, that they can borrow through a program. Um, and then they also warehouse loans where they lump together hundreds or thousands of different projects and resell those, which brings new money into the system to be able to, to make those small loans again. Um, and, so, and so lumping them together and reselling them to, to another organization um, in, the, in the private market. And um, the Connecticut Green Bank is the best example of a green bank in the, in the United States. Um, they were created in 2011 and um, have had tremendous impacts. Uh, just in the last year, the Connecticut Green Bank invested $40 million in public capital and they leveraged that almost nine to one. So they, br they brought in $312 million in private investments um, through the various funding programs and, and, and projects that they have. Um, there's different ways that they leverage that capital. Um, and so, and so their $40 million turned into more than $350 million in project investments last year alone. Um, and one of, the, one of the really important things about green banks is that they're all about crowding in the outside funding. It's not, we're gonna finance this project and keep your hands off it. It's tr they're trying to actively bring other local banks and lenders into the fold and help them to, to cover uh, these types of projects. It's all about, increasing the, the playing field and, and making more people able to participate. Um, and so the Connecticut Green Bank, um, through the projects that they financed last year, they generated almost $18 million in state tax revenues. Um, and so creating programs, creating projects, creating investments is then is in recycling that into the community and helping to, to pay taxes. They created 3,300 jobs and that they're, the Connecticut Green Bank funded 7,600 residential solar installations last year. Um, and so to put that in perspective, in Maine last year, Revision Energy installed 530 solar residential solar installations. Um, so the Connecticut Green Bank financed more than 10 times as much as the largest solar installer in the state of Maine um, installed last year. So just an incredible scale that the Green Bank brings to the table and, and uh, provides the funding to, to make happen. So there'll be a tremendous boost to the solar and, and clean energy industries having, having this type of funding available. And one of the things that's really amazing about the Connecticut Green Bank um, is for their residential solar programs, one of their primary programs is targeted specifically towards low income households. So trying to make sure that those with the lowest means are able to participate in the programs. Um, and they even have one that's focused on uh, communities of color and disadvantaged communities and trying to make sure that um, they're including, including those, those groups. 
Um, and so those are the types of things that a green bank can, once you have the funding available, they can target programs um, as needed to help overcome the, the barriers and the hurdles um, in, the, in the marketplace. Um, and so last year they installed 73 megawatts of clean energy, mostly solar, but they, they installed some wind and hydro and, and some other small projects as well. Um, and that put them over their state goal of 350 megawatts of clean energy installation, I think over the last five years. Um, and, and so they're now looking at increasing their goal for clean energy in the state because um, they've hit it so, so quickly. And the projects that were installed last year in Connecticut funded by the Green Bank will um, offset almost 1.2 million tons of carbon dioxide. So there's a huge uh, climate benefit to, to a Green Bank and the, and the programs that they do. Um, the, the Green Bank also does a lot of market development, um, advertising, outreach, um, consumer, uh, Help, helping direct consumers towards the right contractor. Um, and certainly there's overlap with Efficiency Maine um, and Efficiency Maine and the Green Bank would need to you know, be closely affiliated and, and work together to, to maximize the benefits and share you know, the resources that, that are each have available. Um, one of the big thing, things that a Green Bank does as they, as they bring different banks in and they offer a loan loss reserve or other incentives to the banks to participate, they can help standardize all the forms and lending requirements so that as a consumer, you're getting the same paperwork regardless of which contractor or which bank you're, you're dealing with. Um, so it just streamlines things and, and makes it much easier to, to get through the whole process. Um, they can create a project tracking data, database and especially in a state like Maine with so many rural areas, it would be really beneficial to keep track of where where efficiency and solar projects are taking place to be able to target communities with the with the most need and have geographically targeted um, programs in the future. Um, they can do job training and contractor certification to, to in, ensure quality control um, and then helping to develop project pipelines bringing in um, you know, uh, customer development and being able to provide leads out to different companies, you know, as, as customers come in looking for a loan and haven't lined up a contractor yet or those types of things. Um, and so in terms of creating a, a green bank in Maine, um, the, the biggest question is, well, where does the money come from? Uh, and so the, the bill that we introduced um, in the legislature called for $100 million in bond funding. Um, and in Maine, there's limited bonding capacity. And so that's probably unrealistic. And, and the Green Bank might be able to get a few million dollars in bond funding, uh, but it, it's, it's very unlikely to be able to pull in that sort of funding upfront. Uh, the, the Maine Public Employee Retirement System could invest into a Green Bank um, and they have over a billion dollars invested in fossil fuels. So it's a huge opportunity to divest our retirement system from the fossil fuels and reinvest into clean energy projects directly in the state. Um, the, the, there's a federal bill um, in Congress to create a national climate bank, um, which would have funding that could be provided to state level green banks. Um, they could be funded through a credit enhancement where the state can provide uh, bonding authority to the Green Bank, uh, or they can receive nonprofit or foundation grants. Um, and, then, and then the less likely end of the spectrum, um, the main general fund, the, the state budget, I'm sure is going to be very, very restricted for the next few years with the um, pandemic going on. Um, so that is probably not an option. And the Connecticut Green Bank received some funding through the, the, the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative, or REGI. Um, and most of the REGI funds in Maine are going towards Efficiency Maine and funding their programs. So again, probably not a good source of funding because we don't want to um, pull from Efficiency Maine. We, we want to create new funds within the, within the um, clean energy sector. Um, and so in terms of uh, divesting and reinvesting Maine PERS, I actually led a webinar on this um, for Earth Day. 
Um, but they have over a billion dollars invested in fossil fuels as of December 31st. And sadly, I think that's probably dropped by 30 or 40 percent so far this year, just because the, the fossil fuel industry has been hit hardest by the, the market recession. Um, and in my mind, Maine PERS should not have any fossil fuel investments. Um, I went into a lot of detail on that in my previous webinar, um, but it's funding climate change, it's funding fossil fuels, and all of those companies are based out of Maine. So that's all investments that are leaving the state. Um, reinvesting that through the Maine Clean Energy Fund would keep those funds in the state, circulating in Maine, creating local tax revenue and creating local jobs. So it could have a much greater impact um, in addition to returning um, interest and in, in increasing the retirement fund for, for the retirees of Maine. Um, and there's potential for, for those funds to be invested directly into the local homes and businesses. Um, the concern is that to require Maine PERS to divest from fossil fuels will probably need a constitutional amendment to the Maine Constitution. So it's a little bit more, it's a bit, it's certainly a bigger push um, to achieve that than, um, than doing something that just requires legislation and the governor's signature because the, the constitutional amendment requires a two thirds majority um, is my understanding. Um, and so then the, the Federal Green Bank, um, the, the bill has been introduced both in the House and the Senate. Um, and the, I've got the bill numbers there. I'd, I'd highly encourage you all to reach out to our senators and our representatives and encourage them to support these bills. Um, and there's discussion of having this be included in one of the next bailouts. Um, it seems likely that there's going to be another federal bailout and um, there's a big push to try to include this in that and make sure that if we're funding uh, an economic recovery, that there's specifically funding for solar and clean energy and creating a, a green jobs um, throughout the country. Um, and so the idea with the federal green bank is that it'll be capitalized with $35 billion and over the next 30 years, they'll be able to leverage a trillion dollars in private capital, have over a trillion dollars in total investments over the next 30 years um, in clean energy and climate uh, recovery projects. Um, and so that could be one of the biggest things um, to actually move forward and, and fund the solutions that we, that we need throughout the country. Um, and then I, there's additional resources. The Connecticut Green Bank has a very um, accessible website. Um, it's not, there's not a lot of really technical, difficult to digest information. I've, I've reviewed their annual report each of the last few years and it's just fantastic. It's a great summary of some of the impacts that they've had. And, uh, and I use that for some of the information that I included in the presentation tonight. Um, the Coalition for Green Capital, um, we worked closely with them in Nevada. They provided, uh, they actually conducted, in Nevada we passed the Green Bank in two stages. First we passed a study and then, and then took up the study in the interim between legislative sessions and then came back in the subsequent session and, and passed the Green Bank. And the Coalition for Green Capital led the Green Bank study that we did in Nevada uh, so I worked closely with Jeff Shubb on, on that and, and then replicated the, uh, the legislation that we passed in Nevada for, for the bill that we, um, that we introduced in Maine. And clearly with the session ended prematurely, the, the Green Bank wasn't created this year, um, but I would love to see it become a priority for the governor in terms of an economic recovery in the state. And this seems like something that if there's an emergency session or a special session um, to address the, the pandemic, uh, to me, that would be a great opportunity to include a statewide green bank to fund, uh, fund the solutions and help to create jobs in, in efficiency and clean energy throughout the state. Um, and I see a question um, for the bill numbers. And so I'll just type those in the chat box and, um, 
that that is my presentation um and so we can transition to questions i think great thank you david yeah um keep posting questions in the chat um we have david here for about another 20 minutes or so we're going to do our best to also get questions off facebook if there are any um but yeah we'll we'll prioritize the ones in the chat and then um see where we get um, we will end at eight, the formal presentation, but if there are extra questions, David has said he has a couple extra minutes, um, and we can have that discussion then. So with that, yeah. Um, are there any questions or comments? David, do you uh, do you see the chat or uh, I'll? Yeah. Okay. Um, Can you read it out loud. So the so the question. Do Do you want to read it and I'll answer? Um, sure. Yeah. However you want to do it, but just so everyone can hear, um, would the Green Bank be able to fund very large projects? Um, yeah. No, that's a really interesting question. Um, internationally, there's about a dozen countries that have green banks. Um, and the UK Green Investment Bank funded some of the largest offshore wind projects in the world off the coast of Scotland. Um, and so there's definitely the potential for the Green Bank to fund um, large, large scale projects and, and offshore wind and those types of things as well. Great. Um, yeah, there's, okay, great. Yeah, people are, people are asking now. Okay. How do you compare the difference between Connecticut's wealth and population to Maine's? Um, so um, it's been a while since I looked at it, but I think that Connecticut has about three or four times more people than Maine does. So about three or four times more households and businesses and all that sort of thing. Um, and so to me, the, the important thing isn't the per capita size of it. It's, it's the overall funding size and um, if Connecticut's putting $40 million a year into their green bank programs, Maine could have this equal impact and, and fund at the same level. Um, and really the more funding that can go into it, you know, within, within reason, the better because climate change, I mean, um, it's going to cost 40 to $50 billion or more to transition just the state of Maine to 100% clean energy. Um, and so we need massive investments. Um, and, you know, if, if 7,600 solar installations are done in Maine each year, that's just a greater portion of the, of the total homes in the state. Um, I don't see any, any limits due to our, due to our population um, or, the, or the wealth um, in, in our state. Great question, Becky. Thank you for that. Um, Susan asks, how can organizations like the Sierra Club help to promote the Green Bank Initiative? And I know, David, I'm sure you'll tell us at the end how we can all help, but um, yeah, how can the Sierra Club help? Um, so the, the Sierra Club uh, can help by, uh, they, they have a, a lobbyist typically at the legislature. And so specifically supporting the legislation and lobbying and talking with legislators to encourage them to support the bill. Uh, the Sierra Club can, actually we had a conversation earlier today with Dan Burgess, the director of the governor's office of energy um, that the Sierra Club set up um, on this topic and the consumer owned utility. Um, and so the, the Sierra Club has great resources and, and a fantastic network of volunteers. Um, and, and so being able to lobby at the legislature or with the governor um, and, and make it happen. Great, thank you. Um, Gria asks, please speak to the reception the bill received in the last main legislative session. Yeah, um, the, the bill it only, it was only introduced in committee um, and it was a, it is a complicated bill and took a while to get out of the revisor's office. Um, and so we had a very short window in the, in the last session in 2019 
we had a very short window. I think we, I think we had the bill out of the revisor's office three days before it was introduced in committee. Um, and so typically you want to have the final bill to go and talk to people about, and here's the language. And, and, um, and so it was just very, very rushed um, last year. And, um, but the, the committee was generally supportive, but decided to roll it forward to this year because there were concerns about, um, again, the revisor's office made some edits to the bill um, that created its own board of directors, but also assigned it to work underneath Efficiency Maine, who has their own board of directors. And so things like that, that need to be worked out so that um, Efficiency Maine wouldn't be reporting to two different boards of directors, one for the Green Bank and one also for uh, everything that they do. Um, and so they rolled the bill forward to this year um, and it was introduced in committee um, this year uh, because of the ongoing work of the Climate Council, um, the Energy Utilities and Technology Committee um, decided to make it into a resolve and assign the Climate Council to investigate um, financing solutions and the Green Bank further um, in their work um, statewide. Um, and so it wasn't created and you know we we didn't have uh you know the, the whole thing put into place um but there's certainly steps forward and and positive action and we had some really good reception from the um from the legislators on the energy utilities technology committee okay um peter asks how does david silkman's um it's Richard Silkman. Uh, analysis cover the concept of a green bank. And I assume we're talking about um, Dr. Silkman, the economist, who wrote a report on a vision uh, for a zero carbon economy. Yeah. And um, I haven't read all of Richard Silkman's report yet, uh, but I, I've been to a couple presentations that he's given and, I, and I've read parts of it. Um, and his his solution looks at how Maine can transition to 100% clean energy across all sectors, including transportation by 2050. Um, and it's the most in-depth economic analysis that's ever been done of that in the state of Maine um, and probably one of the best in the country. And his analysis doesn't specifically, at least from, from what I've seen of it, it doesn't specifically identify how things will be funded. Um, but he does make assumptions in terms of interest rates and um, the cost of capital to implement the projects. And one of the big things that, that he found is it's only possible, like financially, it's only possible to transition to 100% clean energy statewide if we can finance at a 3% at a interest rate. Um, if, if the transition to 100% clean energy um, is, is paid for, through utilities that are getting 12 or 13 percent guaranteed profits, um, and so finance at 13, 12 or 13 percent rather than at 3 percent, it will literally cost twice as much to transition Maine to 100 percent clean energy over the next 30 years, and it makes it cost prohibitive. Um, with, within his analysis, um, he found that we can transition to 100 percent clean energy spending the same amount that we're currently spending over that time period. Um, so transitioning from paying for heating oil imported from out of state to paying for the, the loan on a heat pump system um, and those types of things. Um, but his, his analysis was based on financing at 3% interest, um, which is something that I think, I mean, it depends on the specific program, but the Green Bank should be able to make possible. Um, but I would not see the Green Bank funding the entire transition to clean energy in the state. Um, but it would certainly be one piece of the pie and, and helping to fill some of the, some of the needs um, that don't exist in other market sectors. Thanks, David. Thank you, Peter, for that question. Um, what is uh, another question? What about the establishment of a public bank in Maine? I, su I assume um, a general public bank. Yeah. Um, and so um, I've, been involved on the on the edges on the periphery. Um, I know some people that are very keen to create a, a state statewide public bank. Um, looking at the state of North Dakota is the only state with a with a statewide 
bank, um, that the public bank, and um, and there's a lot of benefits to to doing that. Um, but it's an entirely different topic. Like there are two separate things: the green bank, um, and and really that's why the term clean energy fund is is kind of where things are transitioning to. Um, because the green bank is not a bank and cannot uh, perform the same types of financial transactions that, that a typical bank can. Um, and a public bank would not necessarily be investing in, in clean energy projects. Um, and so I think it's a great idea, but it is uh, at this point entirely separate from uh, creating a public bank versus creating a green bank. Yeah, I mean, that's really interesting. Um... Celeste asks, does the Maine Climate Council have a position on green banks? It's very timely. The Climate Council's working groups are putting together their recommendations right now. Yes, um, and the, the green bank has been proposed in at least two of the working groups. Um, it's been proposed in both the energy working group and the, the buildings, infrastructure and housing working group. Um, and I have not been able to participate in all of the Climate Council's workings, um, but one of the things that, that, I, that I do know is that the Energy Working Group has created a subgroup focused on financing. And, um, and that actually came up in our conversation with the Governor's Office of Energy today. Um, and I'm planning to get more involved with that group. Um, but at this point, I think that the Climate Council is primarily focused on um, the solutions, kind of the brick and mortar type solutions of different projects and programs. Um, and I think that the financing piece of it will probably come after, um, but, but it's definitely part of the discussion and, and a green bank is, is part of the discussion in, in multiple working groups of the, of the Climate Council. Okay, yeah. Um, it looks like we might have caught up to the questions in the chat. Um, we have another couple minutes here. If anyone has any other questions, then we'll kind of learn how to get more involved in this. And then, um, yeah, if we do have some extra time, it seems like a small enough group where we could ask a couple other questions off, offline as well. But um, are there any other from Facebook or anyone else with questions? Or, or additional comments. Yeah. Um, someone did ask yeah, about the link. Yes, I will post this um, to our community conversations page, which I'll put the link to in the chat. And I also have put a couple other links to things that popped up, including Dr. Silkman's report. Um, Maybe we could send an email out to the people who've registered with the, those links so they have them directly, Matt. Yes, we will do one email with all these as well. Um, but I'll put the link to our website on the community conversations page where you can view all of these videos and see upcoming schedules for the next ones. Um, looks like another question here. Does the industry have the capacity and workforce to ramp up to deliver this amount of distributed renewable generation in Maine from John? Um, at this point, no, the industry does not have the capacity to, to install this amount of, of energy infrastructure. And that's why we need whole, whole, a holistic approach. We need training programs. We're gonna need to train thousands of new um, workers in the clean energy industry, um, depending, on, depending on the state. And, and I haven't done this analysis in Maine, I mean, but we're going to be looking at 10 to 50,000 people getting into the clean energy sector and into um, other climate solutions. If, if we're going to achieve 100% clean energy by 2050, if we're going to achieve the governor's climate goals, um, there's going to be a massive retooling of, of the marketplace. Um, and at this point, uh, it would take a couple hundred years 
um, for our current solar installers to install the amount of solar that we need to install in the next 30 years. Um, and so there's, there's certainly a lot of, of training and workforce development that will be needed um, both on the clean energy side and, um, and in other climate solutions. All the regenerative agriculture um, and, and carbon sequestration in the soil and those types of things is going to be a, a, you know, probably existing farmers and, and some of the existing workforce, but it's going to be a whole new generation of thinking for how major industries in the state work. Great, thank you. Um, there's a couple questions about participation and um, I, I'll, if, I'd like to just skip those real quick and do one question before, and then we can talk about how we can all participate and get involved. Um, there's one question about the AmeriCorps recovery energy efficiency proposal that you mentioned and whether it needs a green bank as well. Um, yeah, so one, one of the proposals that I introduced to the, to the Climate Council um, and, and someone else introduced a very similar proposal. And so several of us have been collaborating on um, refining that and, and working to narrow that down. Um, but would be to create a, an AmeriCorps program that's a statewide clean energy core um, that has AmeriCorps volunteers that are providing door-to-door -door outreach to households throughout the state. Um, I helped to create a similar program in Nevada and we had AmeriCorps members that directly, well, they couldn't directly install the LED light bulbs because the state lawyers were so concerned about the risk of having the members turning in a light bulb um, and thought that was too risky an activity, but we provided over 10,000 LED light bulbs to uh, in low income communities and thousands of low flow shower heads as well as like the lowest hanging fruit for energy efficiency. Um, and then the AmeriCorps members were trained as, as BPI energy auditors, Building Performance Institute energy auditors. So they were uh, trained as professionals in the field um, and then distributing information on existing programs, whether it's through the weatherization assistance program or, or utility rebates or, or otherwise um, to help, help those uh, communities, help people sign up for energy audits and home efficiency retrofits and, and clean energy projects. Um, and so the idea is that the, the Clean Energy Core would be a statewide um, training and workforce development program that's also generating leads and, and building support in the community. So there's actually projects um, that need to be implemented. And that was one of the big um, drawbacks of the Recovery Act in 2009 that provided millions and millions of dollars across the country to fund weatherization technician training programs and energy auditor training programs. Um, but they'd have 50 or 100 people graduate um, depend, I mean, or 10 or 20 or depending on the, the state or the size of the program. And, and there wasn't work for them to do because there weren't households that were ready and able to pay for efficiency improvements. And so thousands of people across the country were trained in energy auditing and weatherization um, and, then, and then couldn't get jobs because there just wasn't the demand for, for that type of work. Um, and so the Green Bank um, is not necessary, like those are two separate programs, but the Green Bank then makes it easy for anyone to finance those solutions. And so helps to provide another piece of the puzzle in terms of uh, if an AmeriCorps member is talking to a low income household who you know, spends $4,000 a year on heating oil, but can't afford the, the cost of the efficiency improvements that they need, then the green bank can plug in as the the funding source to to bridge that gap and, and make that happen um, and so they they can be very very closely integrated um, but they can also operate as as separate independent programs really interesting yeah thank you for that sue and um, the last two questions always the biggest ones what can we do how can we participate now that you've um, got us educated and interested and you know we're all ready to make this happen um specifically what can citizens in maine do to support the green bank especially those 
um, who live in districts where there's no chance that our reps will support it. Um, and so what's, what's interesting to me is, is I think that every representative should support this um, because the Green Bank is the free market solution. It's all about helping other banks to invest in, and helping keep the, the money flowing um, in, the, in the marketplace and, and helping to encourage and increase investment in, in local jobs. Um, it is not a handout to anyone. Um, it's the, the Green Bank is making loans at two or three percent interest, and uh, and so really is the free market solution. And so I really think that it, it helps bridge the gap um, that that exists in a lot of places um, between the Democrats and Republicans in office. Um, and and this really is the you know the free market solution to creating energy independence in the state of Maine. Um, and right now, statewide, we spend four to five billion dollars a year importing fossil fuels from outside the state. In the last decade, fifty billion dollars left our state economy um, to to bring in coal, oil, natural gas, propane, and you know electricity produced from fossil fuels. Um, and so, transitioning to 100% clean energy is necessary to keep that money in our local economy and and keep keep our state afloat. Um, we can't afford every decade to spend an entire year's GDP importing fossil fuels. Um, it, it's you know, downward spiral um, for our state economy as long as we're importing fossil fuels. And so we don't have any fossil fuel resources. The only way that we as a state can be energy independent um, is through clean energy. Um, and the Green Bank is technology agnostic. It can invest in any type of project. Um, so, you know, it's not pitting the solar industry versus wind versus uh, biomass. Uh, we, we need in all of the above uh, a whole array of solutions if we're going to achieve 100% clean energy, both within Maine and, and around the world. Um, and so it's just so important to have um, technology agnostic financing solutions that, that can bring everyone to the table and help make sure that all the projects that needed to happen can get funded. Okay, so um, Roberta, it looks like, I don't know if you have reached out to your representative, but um, we can definitely all reach out to our representatives. And um, the Climate Council is going through their process. We don't, I don't know if you know David or anyone else quite how the working groups will take input, but we do know that mid-June in about a month, there will be a public climate council meeting. Um, so that might be a good opportunity for people to participate. Um, yeah. Letters to the editor is usually another good option. Any other thoughts on participating? Yeah, um, for anyone that wants to help get the public employee retirement system to divest from fossil fuels and reinvest that through the green bank into or, or through other means into clean energy in Maine, um, as part of the webinar I led two weeks ago, um, we were encouraging people to write letters to the, the board of directors for the public employee retirement system, as well as to the governor to try to put that issue on the radar um, and make sure that um, a billion dollars of our retirement fund isn't paying for destruction of the planet and, and fossil fuel investments. Great. Um, all right. Well, we are just about a time here. I'm just going to show um, a slide that shows our next community conversation. And uh, just to reiterate a couple things you can do, um, reach out to, to me if you're interested in any of our volunteer teams. Um, we mentioned contacting our legislators. I will send around to what we talked about tonight and all these links in one form. Uh, many of them are in the chat box. And next community conversation is Tuesday, May, same time um, with Meg Sheehan and Sandra Howard about the Hydro-Quebec um, mega dams and the um, corridor project. So that will be really interesting Tuesday, May 19th. 
you can RSVP um, on our community conversations page. Uh, it's the same link just for all of you who are on this call. Um, so you know you've already participated, but it, it is helpful if you can RSVP. And then we just learned today, Tuesday, June 2nd, we'll have Stephen Strong, um, Solar Design Associates. Uh, we'll have more on that very soon. So thank you everyone very much for taking some time with us this evening. Um, these are going really well. We're excited to keep doing these every couple of weeks. Thank you to David Gibson and um, all the other volunteer leaders at the Sierra Club. And um, I'm happy, I don't know, David, if people do have a couple comments, we can stop the recording and see if people are around. But um, I will stop the recording now officially. Those on Facebook. And um, yeah, thank you all.